Mr. Navid Khan. Um, I'm part of the Oracle team um, and work as a data scientist. Um, so one of these unicorns, colorful unicorns, walking around along the streets, one of them. And I have a presentation which is a bit mixed. Um, my original idea was that it's a lot of buzz about neural networks. I think we have had almost every presentation that has anything to do with neural networks. Is that correct? I saw some people nodding. And I am one more. <laughs> but I have another pitch within that as well, and that has to do with collaboration. So uh, I know that a couple of keynote speakers, I don't know if you've heard about that, so it's one thing to have a theory or an idea, and then you develop an algorithm, you look at the prediction rate, and you see the accuracy, and that's really good. But how do you take that into production? There was a lot of debate. Did you see the panel interviews that had the discussion about that? I'm going to cover a little about that as well and how we in Oracle sees uh, within that area. But let's start from the beginning. So one of the ideas, as you probably heard, and maybe some of you are new, so I have a part of it, this part, which is a bit of an introduction, but for those of you who are familiar with this, you can chill for a while, and then we go into the deep stuff later on. But one of the ideas was that, uh, from the scientist's perspective, was how does the brain work? And that has been a interesting question or an interesting area for many, many years. And we're still not yet there to cover that whole part of how it actually works. It's still a mystery, but we are a long way along the path. And, and the interesting part is that how is neurons within the brain actually communicating with each other and how are we learning with help of the neurons inside the brain? So how is uh, learning actually transferred in the brain? Now, the other part when it comes to artificial neural networks or deep learning is that once we try to figure out neurons, can we actually mimic that behavior? So the way that our biological neuron works, can we actually make that in a digital format and copy that behavior and create predictive algorithms using that? And that's a bit of the thing that I'm going to present about today. Now, if we look at from the previous age. So how many have, uh, I think that this has been a topic discussed quite a lot about Alan Turing. Uh, I think everyone knows who that is right now, right? But how many have heard about uh, the Turing test, for example? Oh, everyone, basically. <laughs> so, uh, as you all know, then, the idea was that can we somehow create an intelligence that is so intelligent that when a human being interacts with it, he or she will not be able to distinguish the difference between an artificial intelligence or an actual human being, right? And one of the things uh, that was interesting, that how many knows what this is? This gigantic piece. Oh, again, a lot of people uh, have been looking into this. So during the Second World War, uh, there was a lot of, uh, there was a space within encryption and decryption that was quite interesting because you would needed to transfer communication and, you know, intelligence, strategic decisions on how do you send the troops back and forth and what are the things you have to do. And of course, you cannot just broadcast that directly in the radio, so you need to encrypt the message, right? So that's the area of decryption and encryption which became quite popular, the theory of uh, cipher codes and stuff like that. And one of the things during the Second World War was that there was a manual work there. So both sides um, in, in the war, if you like, they were using people or humans who were listening to radio communication and then actually recording that or uh, transferring that further to mathematicians who then manually tried to calculate this message that had been encrypted. How do we break that code or how do we get that specific key so we understand what the message is? Now, that was a lot of human work. It took a lot of time. So Alan Turing had an idea that why are we doing this in a manual way? Why not let machines do this and process that information. That was like one of the first steps within the artificial intelligence area. So this gigantic machine, it did one thing and one thing only, and that was to take decrypted or encrypted message. So if I write, we are about to attack 12 o'clock, probably that wasn't exactly the message, but anyway, we encrypt that and then it was gibberish. So how do we decrypt that to understand what was the original message? That was the whole idea. And then we have a huge machine it took approximately 12 hours to decrypt like one sentence or something like that, but that was an era of artificial intelligence, one step ahead. 
And this was the Enigma machine, uh, which we tried to, which the Nazis then created and tried to decrypt those coded messages. Who knows these two people, or have heard about these two people? Okay, so the, um, uh, Warren McCullen, a famous uh, uh, neuroscientist, and the other one, a famous mathematician. They were the ones who actually started to, in practice, try to figure out how can we take these neural or the neurons in the brain and create a mathematical model about it, or actually create a mathematical understanding of what the neurons does. And they had that idea, so how do we create the model? And there were a couple of things that they created which was really interesting. The first one was threshold logic, the other one was activation function. How many have heard about either one? I guess a lot of people have heard about activation function. So the idea was that can we use the way that the brain works. So if we look at the brain, I have a screen later on which covers that. If we look at the neurons firing away uh, electrical impulse and then aggregating them, and then uh, actually the sum of that impulse would giving a message. And I'm going to explain a bit more what I mean by that. And then these two theories come, came into play. So if we look at neurons, these are two neurons connected. So for example, if I'm touching my skin like this, I have something called receptors on the skin. They are stimulating, or when I'm pressing my finger against them, it uh, creates an electric impulse. And depending on how hard I press, it's covering uh, several neurons or receptors. And the aggregated sum of my impulse, if, or the impulse that's created when I press my skin, that is then calculated and then further processed along this neuron. So that's what's activation uh, potential means, so the sum of the electric impulse. And once it reaches a threshold, it sends that signal further on along the neurons to the brain and then signals something is happening. Because if you think about it, that threshold is the same thing as if I press like this, I'm going to feel something, but you're not feeling anything from the air, right? As Because we have air around us right now. So that basically means the threshold hasn't been reached, therefore it's no signal sending to the brain. But if it's windy outside, that threshold is meeting, then we can feel, and it sends a signal to the brain. And that was the whole idea uh, when, we were, when we were trying to figure out how neurons worked and then try to actually create an artificial neuron to take that concept. So, then the idea, of course, was can we create a medical model about this or from this? And that became artificial neural networks. So, same principle. We have inputs. And once it reaches a specific threshold, it further along passes a signal. And that threshold, I don't know how many heard, the, there was another presentation from Amazon earlier about neural networks. How many were on that session? A couple, yeah. So there we went, or they actually went through a couple of these activation functions. That's what I mean. There's a lot of different, depending on different models or different use cases. But one of the most famous ones, I think you mentioned that was sigmoid function. That's the one that's most commonly used. And that basically what it does is aggregates the inputs and creates some thresholds based on the learning. And we're going to cover that later on. And then firing up our impulse and sends the information further after calculations. So if we look at an example, now I took a fraud detection example. Now in reality, it wouldn't be this simple, but this was mostly to illustrate the concept of neural networks. So, Let's imagine that we have a case uh, and we're working within the financial sector and having a fraud detection use case with credit cards, for example. And then I, make do, I might be do some feature experiments or feature extractions to look what interesting features do I have to work with that could be interesting. And my ultimate goal is to detect or predict is this a fraudulent behavior or not? And how does neural network work? Well, basically, these features become input. Now you might say, well, I had six inputs, why do you have four? Well, it was because the screen wasn't big enough. <laughs> that was the easy explanation, so my architect became four. No, but joke aside, it's supposed to be six, but that's the input layer, so that's my features, basically. Then there's something called hidden layers. That's where the magic is happening, because what's actually happening there is that it makes calculations to look into how these features are related to each other based on the goal of to detect a fraudulent behavior or not. Because if you think about this, if you work with other algorithms, most of, for example, clustering, they are looking at each feature individually. The idea of neural networks that you take the features that you have 
and then let the algorithm calculate those features and create their own features. How many have heard about that idea that neural network creates their own features uh, in the algorithm? Raise your hands. Oh, half of the audience, maybe a bit more. So that's what hidden layers done. And, and the interesting part with the buzzword deep neural network, for example, that's basically the idea that you do further transfer of knowledge. So the deeper the network, the more interesting hidden patterns you can find. And that's, so if you look at the network architecture, we're going to come to that later on, convolution networks, for example, which is really famous or popular to use for image detection or audio detection and stuff like that. That's, what it ha that's one of the basic things, that they try to uh, take the original problem, split it into pieces, and then puzzle the way all the way ahead to the goal. And I'm going to show you a bit more there. OK, so we have the hidden layers. That's basically calculating the input layer and creating their own features. And then you have the output layer. Now, in my problem, it's a classification problem. So either it's a fraudulent behavior or not. That's why I have two outputs. So the one that gets the biggest score that's the one that's most likely to happen in this case. If you have a regression problem, for example, that let's say I'm planning to make a presentation, my input feature are time spent, uh, my knowledge, uh, how is the projector, for example, and what I want to predict is what will the, be, the score be on my presentation. So I have a one output, that's the score, and that might be from zero to 10. So I'm predicting like, okay, how good should, uh, would that presentation be based on input? OK, so what happens? So how many have heard about forward and backward propagation, for example? Raise your hands. A little more than half. So that's basically the idea of training and predicting. So in the backward propagation, you have the features uh, and the data set. And um, you might be splitting the data set 70-30, so 70 for training maybe, and then 30 for prediction. And you use the features and the the actual output, so a supervised learning algorithm, that's what it is, you have a training set. And you, f you f put that forward in the network, so you take the inputs in the input layer and then do something called backward propagation. Uh, I'm not going to go into detail exactly of the calculation, but you're going to see a screen, but don't worry, later on. Uh, and what happens is that when you do this process of backward propagation is that you have the output and you have the input, which is the actual card number, the amount, and so on. And then you have already the result of what was this uh, fraudulent behavior or not. And then you basically calculate backwards to, have, to reach this goal or this, data or this actual prediction, how would my weights be set based on this input? That's what backward propagation is. So first step would be, yeah, uh, 0 0.27, that's how I'm evaluating the weight of this input. Uh, 0 0.59 is the next one, and so on. And the hidden layer, that's, as I mentioned earlier, that's how the algorithm is calculating its own features based on the ones that it has. So it's making its own decision that, okay, based on this data I have, how is the different features correlated and what important features can I create based on the input as I originally. Okay, there are many, many different types of networks or architectures for different use cases. We have heard a bit about convolutional neural networks, for example, so if you've been on, on those sessions. The one that we saw now was a feed-forward neural network, so I have input, and I'm basically just passing uh, the data forward to do my predictions. And when I do the training, I'm looking at the training set or the output and then calculating the weights. And that was, again, uh, weights were the ones that was determining how input or how important an input was or a feature was, for example. And then we have convolutional neural networks. So uh, a couple of interesting use cases for that is image detection, for example, or um, uh, um, uh, voice recognition and stuff like that, which has been quite popular in the latest years. And there are many, many use cases for this uh, that's been popular. Um, facial recognition, natural language processing, fraud detection, uh, autonomous driving has been quite popular. Um, how many have been experimenting with neural networks today? Raise up your hands. A couple of people, okay. Um, the next thing I want to say is that how many have heard about or heard the phrase that neural networks or, uh, or deep learning is a black box solution? 
Raise your hands. Quite a lot of people, right? And it, so I both like and don't like that argument because it depends on who you talk to. And my interpretation is that, uh, and I don't know what your interpre interpretation is, that many people say this is that, okay, I have some inputs, I train the model, and then magically gives me some output, and the black box part is that I don't know exactly what it's doing in these hidden layers because it's quite theoretical and it's quite difficult to manage what happens. And that is uh, somehow, you could say, a problem with neural network because it requires a lot of competence in understanding what exactly is the neural network doing. So, for example, this activation function I was talking about, there are many different types of activation functions depending on what use case you want to do. So how do I determine which activation function I want to use in different use cases that can, you know, uh, uh, change the prediction rate or prediction accuracy, for example. And if I don't know that, then that can be quite difficult to get a good result with neural networks. Um, I heard a lot of people or a lot of presentations before was that uh, since there's a lot of buzz with neural networks, a lot of people say, oh, we want to do artificial intelligence, we want to do deep learning, we're going to use neural networks. That's like the first thing. And then when you, when you discuss, okay, what's the use case or what are you exactly going to do? Oh, and one might be, oh, I want to predict what's the likelihood for my customer to leave me, like churn, or I want to predict how many products I'm going to sell in the next three months. And then the next question you typically ask, at least for my case, is that have you tried these other algorithms like regression or clustering or support vector? And the typical answer is, no, I haven't. And that's one take that I can uh, you know, present to you, is that neural networks are really, really powerful, and, and that's the same, same thing that a lot of presenters have said, but it's really good for specific topics. And best practice would be to try other algorithms for this use case and see what is the prediction rate and accuracy. And once that doesn't fulfill your needs, then jump over to neural networks and experiment. Do you guys concur? I can see some nodding. And some might be question marks, <laughs> but I see someone nodding. Okay, so is neural network a black box? Uh, I would strongly say no, theoretically speaking, because it is, uh, you can prove what actually is being spit out from the neural network and why. The problem is, as you can see, it can be really theoretical. That's one of the difficulties, right? And my idea of this slide was to somehow demystify the myth about a deep learning or neural network as a black box solution, because it's not. It's just that it can be complicated sometimes. So what are we looking at? And one of the ideas I had in my slide was to, to demystify this myth about black box, but otherwise that hopefully you can write in your LinkedIn profile that you have neural network competence after this slide. So this is a, like neural network 101, hopefully. So what are we seeing? How many know what a cost function is? Raise your hands. A lot of people, okay. So for those of you who don't know, that's basically the accuracy of my, my model. So how good am I predicting? My predictions versus my actual values. And the difference is the cost function. That's the easiest way. So if I'm predicting exactly as my training said, then the cost function would be zero. If I'm predicting and there's a large, huge difference, then that number would rise up quite high. And the goal is, of course, to reach zero. But there are some uh, challenges to that, because if you're zero, there are some other issues that you can bump into, and I'm going to come into that later. This lovely function, what does that actually say? It's a really complicated function, but what it actually says is that what is the difference between my actual value and my predicted value of all my training sets? That's what it is. And, that's, and the difference there is that if it's close to zero, then I'm predicting quite close to my, my training set. If it's a lot further from zero, then the, the actual prediction is worse than my training set, so I'm not predicting so good. How many know what this term is in neural networks? Some, some people are raising their hands. Well, shit. <laughs> so this is the regularization term. So this basically... Uh, the object of or the goal of this is to try to avoid underfitting or overfitting a model. And that's what you see here. So I tried to do it a bit. Now I know that this doesn't really represent the reality, but it was just for a visual demonstration. So uh, the green, or let's say the blue dots, that's my training set, as you can say. 
and the red line is my prediction, and the green dotted line, that's my errors. So you can see in the first model, I'm not predicting so well. There are quite huge errors. The second one, yeah, it's still some errors, but it still seems to represent the majority of the data set. But then I have another one saying that the error is none. And then there comes the question, does that mean that that model is best? How many would say that that model is the best one? That was almost like a rhetorical question because I don't think anyone's going to raise their hands now, right? Okay, so that's basically not so good because I'm kind of overrepresenting the training set and training set, and that's what overfitting means. So it might be really good for this, but once I set it in production, it might not be exactly that data set that that algorithm bumps into. So it might not predict so well or won't represent the majority of the data. So the goal was that maybe the middle one might be one of the best. And once I've done all that, uh, calculated the error and so on, then I receive uh, my weights, if you like. Okay. Some of you might fe feel that, oh, this was best. I, I was about to say, what's the word? Best as en skjort bröd. Is that a Swedish, <laughs> um, Swedish sentence? But uh, do I really need to know all this math? Some might argue yes, some might argue no. And it might depend on the role, and it might depend on what is the use case. I always think it can be good to understand it, because then you can avoid this black box thinking with, when using neural network. You can actually start to debug what exactly they do, which activation function should I use, and so on. But nowadays, there are a lot of solutions which can compare models based on the settings you have. So you might not need it as well. But I'm interested in looking into what I put in my algorithm and why it spits out the way it does. So it's always a good thing to understand why is it doing as it does. OK, let's look into an example. How many have played this specific game? OK, how many played this game when it existed on, I think it was Super Nintendo, which you couldn't save progress? Yep. And how many were frustrated that you couldn't reach the end level? OK, I have a solution for you. So what we're going to see now is that we're going to use the neural network and see how can you train a model uh, with neural networks, and in this case, the game, so that the output, which is basically the commands, like when should I jump, when should I run, and so on, in, in Mario's case, is the most relevant or is the best move in that specific scenario. So I'm going to use math and neural networks, if you like, or statistics, whatever we want to call it, and train my model. And in this case, the model, I'm going to show you what that is, uh, is going to do a prediction on how to complete the task or the level in the best way. So my data input is frames of the Mario. So you can see Mario, you can see the enemies. You know who, who the enemies are, right? Yeah. And you can pick up some magic mushroom. Oh, sorry, not magic mushroom, but mushroom. Anyway, you get superpowers from that. And the first step is that you need to do a data transformation or data formatting. So the input for the neural network, so it understands what can I jump on or what can I not. And then basically it says good and bad. So the black dots, enemies, white dots, it's a good thing that you can jump on. And Mario is the red, red line. And then the decision, that's the output. So what commands can I do? Can I jump? Can I walk? Can I duck? And so on. And then the goal, what the, this neural network is going to benchmark against, is how fast can I reach that end flag that you do in the Mario so you, you complete the course in minimum time. Uh, that's the end goal. So let's look. So I'm going to. So, so now my neural network is quite done. This is in the, tr in the training set in the beginning. And you can see the input. That's the white things that I can jump on. That's the data formatting that it does, so it understands what, it, what I'm looking at, or the neural network understands what it's looking at. And the black dots is the enemies. And you can see in the beginning, it just press the command right. And what it's benchmarking against is my fitness. That's a score that says how far have I progressed in this Super Mario. So if I reach the end phase, which is the flag, then that's the maximum score. 
And then I'm training this network for, in this case, called um, several generations, but anyway. So once I train this with several, uh, several uh, courses, if you like, or several times, I've created these hidden layers, and that's where the magic is happening, right? So that's where I can see that based on my input, where my enemies are, where I can jump, and where I can't jump, how should I push my commands in this case? That's the output to complete the goal in the best way. And you can see, yeah, it took a couple of generations of trial and error and tried out different, different methods. And this is using a specific, uh, another algorithm as well, which is called uh, genome algorithm. And basically what that does is that it tries several different type of architects. And then it, you can say it creates a baby neural network, you could say, <laughs> where it's combining the best neural networks from two areas and then seeing what was the score with this new one. And then it takes another neural network and combines the best one with these two and see what was the score then, and so on and so on, until it learns that this was the best architect to accomplish the goal. Okay, so now we have covered a little about neural network, what it is, a little examples, and looked under the, under, uh, under the hood as well. But there are a couple of challenges from a project management perspective. So, and, and this was a topic as well where a lot of people were discussing that how it's really good to apply neural network, you can solve a lot of problems and so on, but how do I take an idea into production in reality? So from an hypothesis, trying out in the sandbox environment, using neural networks, it, it works fine, but from there, setting it to a business value, setting it in production uh, to my end users, how do I do that? And a couple of challenges might be time. So it can be time consuming if you're using a lot of open source products and so on. I'm testing it. I don't have maybe the right resources or the right server capacity and so on. So how can we solve that? The other one is, of course, deployment, as I mentioned. So from an idea, uh, we might want to try a hypothesis. So this was also another topic in the keynotes that do we really want to have a big bang approach or do we want to try with small ideas, uh, deploy them, uh, more iteratively and try to see, was this accomplishing a goal? No, try again. So trial and error, that was a key takeaway from a lot of the keynotes, right? And this is a, a concept that we believe in as well. So how can we deploy these smaller artificial neural networks in this case, or machine learning in general, try it out and see what was the goal and then reinforce or uh, re-evolve the models. Our next problem is dependency. So how many have worked with open source neural networks, for example, or in general machine learning open source? And I don't know about you, but that's one of my biggest headaches to look at the dependencies of the different package and different versions. So for example, if I'm running Python, I'm installing a specific uh, library, uh, is this gonna work with the uh, NumPy version, so on, so on, on Python version, this and that. That can be a big challenge as well. So we have, uh, um, a solution for that that we've worked a lot with and I'm going to show you in a while. Now, the next thing is about this. So, collaboration. So, how can you work in a team in an easy way to accomplish one goal and to share ideas or look at the progress and work in a team to accomplish a specific goal? In this case, the goal seems to be quite easy, just change the bulb. But we all know that in reality, when we do these different type of projects, next best offer in a, in a website, it might sound easy, but it can be quite complex once you come into production and looking into the details. So how do we face that, and how do we accomplish that in an easy way? So from an Oracle perspective, we, we have a platform to solve a couple of these issues. Uh, one, I've written a couple of key key. Uh, message there, so minimize risks, how can you do that with Oracle Platform? Uh, how can you check these dependencies between packages when you're installing open source? We have done that in our platform, so you're gonna see a couple of demos here in, at the end explaining that you more or less choose a task, uh, image recognition for example, or you, you know that you're gonna do deep learning, and then it will install all the packages that might be interesting for you in a cloud environment, and then you can start using your favorite to uh, notebooks, for example, or Jupyter or R or whatever it might be, in a cloud infrastructure environment that Oracle provides. That's what you're gonna see in a while. And of course, how can we then, from an idea, 
take that model and set that into production in a cloud environment. Uh, that's a lot of, that's a one area that we're focusing quite heavily. And that's an interesting area from a cost perspective. So how can you start small with some hypothesis, not needing to buy all these hardware servers and storage and so on, and all the software. And then after that, when you try it, you've already bought a lot of things and you don't know that if your hypothesis was working or not. So you bought a lot of stuff in vain, kind of. So that's an area that we work on a lot of, that you can spin new environments in the cloud and try it out. And once it didn't uh, um, succeed with your task, you can shut down the environment for, for that use case. And once it's interesting, you can set that into production and scale up the environment. Okay, so this is the overall cloud platform. It's based on a cloud infrastructure. Uh, so you have the possibilities to store different type of data sets. So in object store, databases, um, in uh, Hadoop lakes and so on. So we provide that infrastructure in the cloud uh, for all type of data. And then on top of this, you have what's so-called Oracle Data Science Cloud, which is the product that we're gonna look a little bit deeper into, which has all these things that I talked about when it comes to problems. So collaboration, dependencies, how can you scale up the environment, how can you create a test environment for a hypothesis, and once that seems to be interesting, deploy that in a high-scale environment. Everything in the cloud, then. So this is a little how it looks. So this is the front end of the tool in the cloud environment. And right now, I'm just looking at different models. I can see who is working with the models, uh, when would it last run, how many uh, API calls I've had to that model. So I'm going to show that a bit, that once you have a model, you can just uh, create an API uh, connection and then whatever application that wants to have that uh, uh, model can just call on the API and get results, as an example. Um, this is a little about the platform. So it's run, as I said, on a cloud infrastructure, uh, supporting both Oracle, but non-Oracle sources as well. And on top of this, you have a choice. So you can run, for example, Skliklen, uh, open source products, you can run R, uh, you can have a Jupyter Notebook, uh, but you can also use other frameworks like TensorFlow, if you're familiar with that and working with that, you can run that in our cloud platform, so you're not bound to use just Oracle software. That's a big plus at the moment as well. And deployments. So how can you easily create these so-called sandbox environments that I was talking about? So this is in the cloud infrastructure, and once you uh, sign in to the datascience.com, that's a product, you can then choose to start a session. And once you start a session, you can say that, okay, in my uh, virtual machine in the cloud, how much resource do I want to set to that? What are the dependencies, the packages, and so on I want to use? And I can then also choose if I want to deploy that in what way. So over here, you can see um, uh, what tools I've selected. So I've just selected Jupyter here, but you can select which packages. So for example, um, if you want to use uh, TensorFlow, for example, or use Oracle R, which is R for scalable uh, um, deployments from Oracle. You can choose those tools and just launch, and it creates that environment with all those packages pre-installed. Collaboration, you can choose and add users and so on for, uh, for working in the team, and then you can see scores and so on on the, on the model, how many have been using this model, who have access to it, and so many, and which versions uh, are available. And here you can see some examples of uh, how you can test the API so it works. Uh, so you can deploy as the API as I mentioned. You can see res uh, compute resource, how much resource have I dedicated for this environment and so on. Uh, yeah, and uh, we have things like model versioning and model control so you can see uh, how, when was the last time I trained this model? Is there any errors that this model bumped into? What is the accuracy? How many calls has this model received? So I can see if there's a popular model a lot of people are using or not, as an example. Or what are the peaks for this, for this model? Uh, here is the version control, so I can compare different versions of the model. So if I, comp if I for example, if I created a deep learning uh, model, uh, I have uh, set the weights of these neurons differently in these different models, and I deployed all three, let's say I created three, and I want to have a check or compare which one had the best accuracy I can 
get this dashboard visible for me as well. Yeah, and this at the end is just a short video to show you uh, the front end. So right now I'm just on the welcome page, and this is just showing you how you can deploy a session where you want to test or try a hypothesis. So here is this, uh, this, this is the same thing I showed you in the slides, but you can name the session and so on, select what tools you want to use, and all those dependencies will be pre-installed on the Oracle Cloud infrastructure, so the cloud infrastructure that we have that this is running on. And then I can uh, set how much resources do I want to dedicate to this environment and the uh, packages and so on. And once I press launch, that environment is set and I can see uh, that it's up and running, who has access to it, uh, how much compute power it's dedicated for it. And once I say open session, I get my notebook and I can see all the packages are pre-installed uh, for me to use. Okay, so that was a little about uh, deep learning from my perspective. So uh, how you can work with in a collaborative platform, a bit about introduction of what deep learning is and neural network. Now there were a lot of people who already knew about that and probably been hands on. And uh, last part, of course, how you can work in a collaborative platform to try hypotheses and then deploy these algorithms uh, or projects in the cloud in a scalable way. Okay. That was everything from me. Thank you.